Lord Almighty, we thank you for bringing us here today. And we ask that you would open our hearts, open our minds, help us to hear your word this morning. Lord Almighty, I pray that you would remove from us those things that would distract us from hearing your word today. And I pray that you would give us grace, that you would give us your undeserved power to become more and more like your son and accomplish your kingdom purposes in this world today. God, enable us to become more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. My dad's mom was the only one of the five siblings born in the United States. Her family was from Halicia, a province in Ukraine. At one point when I was growing up, my dad decided he wanted to learn Ukrainian. Alas, there were no places that they taught Ukrainian in Los Angeles at the time, so he decided to take Russian at the local community college. At one point, I remember him telling me that the main newspaper in the Soviet Union was Pravda. The name Pravda translates truth. Now keep in mind, this was at the height of the Cold War. At my elementary school in Los Angeles, we were doing bomb drills alongside with the earthquake drills. And I remember thinking, oh man, those lying commies. At least my country doesn't lie and call it the truth. Of course, I have since repented of my folly because deceit knows no boundaries. It's the same for kids. Growing up, I swear to God, was used to end an argument. Of course, it didn't. You didn't need to be very savvy to understand that when someone resorted to using God's name in vain, the primary reason was to cover their tracks and make it look like they were telling the truth. You know, it seems like kids of all ages had the same problem in Jesus' day. Jesus had to tell us in Matthew chapter 5, verse 33, Again, you have heard it was said to those of old, You shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil. Jesus tells us, don't swear to God. If for no other reason than that it breaks the third commandment not to take the Lord's name in vain. And secondly, because using such language almost always is an attempt to deceive by pretending to be godly, which also breaks the ninth commandment. Many, including the kids at my schools, understood that if you use the right words, then others would trust you. They would believe that you told them the truth. That is, until you got caught too often. Dallas Willard got it right. He said the essence of swearing or making O's is to try to use something that, though impressive, is irrelevant to the issues at hand to get another to believe you and let you have your way. This is wrong. And it is unlike God. We got it wrong in school and since. And I have noticed that adults have not grown out of this problem, but have only made it worse, which is why we need the ninth commandment. You and I need to have nothing to hide. Today we want to look at the ninth commandment, which simply is Exodus 20, verse 16. You shall not bear false witness against your near one. Now there are at least five areas to which this commandment can be applied. Number one, don't deceive under oath. Number two, don't deceive your near one. Number three, don't deceive about your near one. Number four, don't deceive about yourself. And last and most importantly, love the truth. Which, of course, is like saying, don't deceive yourself. We're going to learn today, don't play games with 
the truth. Instead, have nothing to hide. Have nothing to hide. So you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. The first point that we're going to look at today is don't deceive under oath. As we saw in Jesus' command, you must not swear to try to convince people that you're honest. Just be honest. We should have nothing to hide. This, in fact, Jesus' brother James told us in a very similar command. In James 5.12, he said, But above all, brothers, do not swear, either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath. But let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Wait, did you just read that right, Pastor Greg? Condemnation? If I add to my yes or no to try to impress someone with my honesty, I might be condemned? I might go to hell? Well, I respond, what's the law? How do you read it? James here seems pretty clear. If you swear to impress people with your honesty, you deserve condemnation. The first application of the ninth commandment, do not deceive under oath, actually has two halves. The first is the way Jesus meant it. Don't try to impress people with your honesty by appealing to God. Because if no one else on the playground takes you seriously, God will. Now, of course, the second half is don't perjure yourself. Don't go to court and tell a lie. Now, throughout his epistle, James makes the point that it is the character of the person that matters. Not perfection, but direction. Are you the kind of person who is willing to lie to your friends to get your way? If so, your direction is condemnation, not glorification. So it's better just to have nothing to hide. Now, to be clear here, I have said from the beginning of our series on the Ten Commandments, I am saved by the wood and I am taught by the stone. Make no mistake. The law is enough to condemn us. We are all of us guilty. You have lied, therefore you stand guilty before the Lord. Unless, of course, you trust in the wood. Unless you have claimed the promises of God for you in Christ, won for you at the cross, in which case your lie will not condemn you. And, this is an important and, we must allow the Ten Commandments to teach us how to live in light of the good news so that we can cling to the cross and have no reason to hide in the first place. In his incisive style, Dietrich Bonhoeffer cuts straight to the bone. He says, complete truthfulness is not only possible where sin is only possible where sin has been uncovered and forgiven by Jesus. Only those who are in a state of truthfulness through confession of their sins to Jesus are not ashamed to tell the truth, whatever must be told. He continues, The cross is God's truth about us, and therefore it is the only power which can make us truthful. When we know the cross, we are no longer afraid of the truth. We need no more oaths to confirm the truth of our utterances, for we live in the perfect truth of God. Make no mistake, in this world, people are not safe. People will use their power over you to harm you, therefore give them no power. And instead of worldly advice... Christian, come clean at the cross. Know your salvation at the cross. And then you will have nothing to hide. Ever. You have no need to lie if you have nothing to hide. 
And then the truth becomes a source of power, not for your enemies. The truth that every one of your lies is paid for is a source of power for you. And the truth will have set you free. Now, of course, like all of the Christian life, this is a journey. It is a level of maturity few attain. But that doesn't mean you should not strive toward this maturity living by the power, the grace of God. So first of all, don't deceive under oath. Secondly, don't deceive your near one. You shall not bear false witness against your near one. Now, Paul is very clear about this application of the ninth commandment. He says in verse Ephesians 14, 4, 15, he says, rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. And in the same chapter, Paul unpacks this one step further. Verse 29, he says, let no uncorrupting talk, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Paul says, speak the truth in love. Now, as you're considering what it is you want to say, ask the question, is it true? According to Paul, truth is preeminent. Paul doesn't want us bearing false witness any more than Moses did. Now, of course, I need to pause for a moment. We need to answer Pilate's question what is truth? Now, I'm not going to get too philosophical, but the simple biblical answer is that the truth is whatever accurately reflects the state of the world. Whatever really is the facts in a given situation. What corresponds to reality? On the other hand, to lie is to deceive. To lie is to try to make someone believe a falsehood, an untruth. It is to make someone believe something that you know is not right. Okay, so we want to tell the truth. But then we have to ask our second question. Is what I want to say kind? Is what I have to say going to help the hearer grow up into Christ? Then I want to ask, is it necessary? Am I trying to impress someone with myself? Am I trying to slander someone else? Am I, with these words, trying to love someone? And then Paul continues in verse 29. He says, let no corrupting talk. Christian, brother, Sister, your job is not to tear down. Your job is not to corrupt the hearer or the reputation of the one about whom you speak. Your job is to build one another up. Now, of course, you have to ask the question, how are you to do this? And Paul is very general here. He says, as fits the situation. In other words... Given the needs of the near ones that Jesus puts around you, in this situation, are you being the kind and loving and truthful person that those around you need to see? Are you being the kind of person who is full of grace? Do you speak grace? Do you live grace? That grace, that living by the undeserved power of God to accomplish kingdom purposes in your life. That grace that goes through you from the cross that enables people near you to become the men and women that God created them to be. Are you an instrument, a tool used by God the Spirit to build one another up? He says, give grace to those who hear. Now I need to tell you, you will find this impossible to do. 
if you are not living in light of the cross. If your sins have not been exposed, then forgiven at the cross, you will not be a conduit of the grace of God because you will not have received it yourself. So go to the cross every day. Preach the good news to yourself. Then take those near you with you to the cross. Lovingly tell the truth so that you will have nothing to hide. Which brings us to an interesting question. When is it okay to lie? We need to talk now about the most famous godly lie in the Bible. Rahab, the prostitute, protecting the Israelite spies from the king of Jericho. Now, I'll tell you right off the top, it's not enough to say that Rahab's lying to the king's guards was overlooked somehow because it was for the good guys. That's not going to work here. Rahab clearly lied, and Rahab's lies were commended. Look with me at James 2.25. Was not also Rahab the prostitute justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? Clearly, Rahab lied. And James, at least, believes that she did the right thing. Now, non-Christians have no problem with this because they don't believe the ninth commandment applies universally. Non-Christians are almost always relativists. They believe that there are no moral laws when it's convenient for them so to believe. And therefore, the ninth commandment doesn't apply to them when they don't want it to. They believe there's only opinions that are subjective to an individual or a culture. That's true for you, but that's not true for me, is their common reply to any moral command. Christians, on the other hand, are what we call absolutists. We believe the Bible is clear and that there are real moral laws that apply in all situations for all times and all people. For example, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, lie, or covet. And Christians also recognize that there are laws that are greater than others. Let me give you an example. Paul commands us in Romans 13 to obey governmental representatives. But then clearly in Acts chapter 5, we see Peter telling the Sanhedrin, his governmental representatives, that it's better to obey God than man. So which is it? Do we obey the government representatives or not? The law to obey clear commands of God stands above the law to obey any government. Likewise, Rahab hiding the spies and then sending them out a different way was clearly a treasonous act to her city of Jericho. Not only that, but don't we have Jesus affirming the principle of laws when he says that the laws of loving God and our near ones were greater than all the other commandments? Allow me two analogies to help us understand what's happening. The first analogy helps us understand how a lie, a law, can always apply and yet be superseded, if you will, by a more important law at that time. The second analogy helps us to understand the severity of the choice you have to make when you believe one law supersedes another. So my first analogy, when a magnet attracts a nail up against the law of gravity, gravity does not disappear. There is no exception. The magnet must be suspended by a force, like my hand, that is greater than the law of gravity acting on it and all the nails it brings up. The law against lying still applied to Rahab. She couldn't just lie about anything at that moment. She could only tell the lie she told to save the lives of the Jewish spies. 
Now the second analogy is that of amputating a leg with gangrene. Cutting off a leg is mutilation, pure and simple. There's no other way of looking at it. Unless that mutilation, that amputation is aimed at saving the life of the person who owns the foot that has gangrene. At that point, the amputation is necessary. It's good. It's not just simply the lesser of two evils. Likewise, using this analogy, when Corey Ten Boom and her family lied to the Nazis inquiring after hidden Jews, they didn't have to go and seek forgiveness from Jesus about the lie. No. They were doing what he expected them to do. Saving life is, of course, what Jesus came to do. Now, how often amputation is necessary in your daily life, I need to leave for you to decide with God the Son. How often a godly lie is justified, I will leave with you to work out with God the Spirit. Only know that you must have nothing to hide because you have nothing hidden from God the Father who is your judge. So no matter what you do, have nothing to hide. The first application was don't deceive under oath. The second was don't deceive your near one. And the third is don't deceive about your near one. I think that one of the most common major ways of disobeying the ninth commandment is gossip. In Proverbs 16, 28, it says, A dishonest man spreads strife and a whisperer separates close friends. A whisperer is someone who spreads gossip. Well, let's define gossip. Gossip is saying something, number one, that the other person would not want said. Something they would not want said, whether it is true or not. You could be telling the truth and still be gossiping. And you're telling this to a person who does not need to know. In other words, does the person you're speaking to have responsibility or authority over this situation and they need to know about it? If that's true, then you're not gossiping. You're just observing. You're passing on the truth. But the fourth element of gossip is, is what you're saying being said with a loving heart? So clearly, don't bear false witness. Specifically, don't gossip about those around you. If you have first-hand knowledge of something, you are to report that knowledge to a person in authority and not anything else. And here it gets tricky because telling the truth about a situation may still be gossip. Does the person you're speaking about want that truth told? Then, does the person you are speaking to have responsibility to do something about it? And if they do, are you telling it to them with a loving heart? Are you speaking the truth in love? Of course, one test to see if you are bearing false witness in this way is to know that gossip is saying something behind that person's back you would not say to their face. The flip side of that is flattery. Flattery is saying something to someone's face you would not say behind their back. Here, the old true advice still stands. Talk to people about God. Talk to God about people, but don't talk about people to people. And when we do this, when this is our practice, we will have nothing to hide. We will have nothing to hide, and we will not bear false witness against our neighbor. But last, four, number four, we should not deceive about ourselves. I take this from 2 Corinthians 4.2, where Paul says, we have renounced, we have turned our back on disgraceful and underhanded ways. 
We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. Here we return to a key principle in the Christian life. You have no need to hide, to lie, if you have nothing to hide. Now, I invest a great deal of effort with all my children that they will know that training your heart to lie is the worst thing you can do. I stand by that. If you train your heart to lie, that it's okay to lie when it's difficult, then you will be capable of doing anything, literally anything. Furthermore, if you are willing to lie, you will find that you have broken most of the other commandments every single time. You will have made yourself out to be God. You will not worship the true God truly. You will have taken His name in vain. You will have dishonored your parents. You will find that you are willing to murder, commit adultery, or steal, lie, and covet. Because you know that you can tell a lie to cover your assets. Lying to make yourself look better than you are is always wrong. Instead, we must have nothing to hide. Which brings us to the final application. We will have nothing to hide if we love the truth. We will have nothing to hide if we are willing not to deceive ourselves. Why should we love the truth? In part because not everyone does. This is Paul's point in Romans 1.18. For the wrath of God is revealed of heaven from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Why? Because they are those who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Ultimately, if you will, if you don't want to speak the truth, you will, you will want to suppress the truth. And God's wrath, His settled, unwavering opposition to all sin is revealed against those who, because they have chosen to align themselves with lie, they have separated themselves from God. Now fortunately, the opposite can also be true. John 8, Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, <clears throat> If you abide by my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. If you will, if you want to know the truth, you will know the truth. If you pursue the truth, you will find him. If you desire to experience the freedom of the truth, you will know grace. You will know His free, undeserved power to accomplish His kingdom purposes in you and through you and for you and for your near ones. So cling to the wood. Love the wood. Trust the wood. All of the promises of God for you in Christ were purchased at the cross. Then, then you will be able to embrace the stone rightly with a gospel vision that sees the commands as teaching you to trust Christ rightly. With a gospel vision that enables you to see the truth with your heart, with your hand, and to speak the truth with your lips. So that truth will not only set you free, but by the power of the Spirit will set your near ones free as well. Nowadays, I would not put it past my government to lie as I did when I was a boy learning about the world and living in fear of Soviet bombs. I will note, however, that our nation is, or at least was, the greatest nation in history, excepting perhaps David's Israel. Still, 
You and I are not called to the good, better, or best. We are not called to compare ourselves to anyone except for Jesus. We are called to be perfect as our Father in heaven is perfect, which is why we must cling to the cross and we must have nothing to hide. Let's pray. Jesus, Almighty God, we cannot accomplish this ourselves, but instead we need to trust in you. We need to rely upon your grace, your undeserved power to speak truth into us and then speak truth through us. Lord, humble us and enable us to know you better so that we will therefore love you and trust you more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.